Hi, everyone. Um, this music makes me feel like very cool. Um, <laughs> like, uh, anyway, <laughs> let's get started. Um, I'm so happy to be here uh, at the first ever Rails World, uh, and I'm uh, honored to be your closing keynote uh, this year for the first day. There's a Aaron is <laughs> closing tomorrow. <laughs> I don't mean to take away your spotlight. <laughs> Um, I want to say thank you to Amanda and the Rails Foundation and everyone volunteering uh, at the conference um, for organizing this year. Um, I'm happy to be here with all of you. Ruby on Rails is so much more than just a framework. It's a community, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Uh, I'm Eileen Uchatel. I used to blog at EileenCodes.com, um, and if I ever start again, you can find posts there. <laughs> Uh, for social media, you can find me on Twitter at Eileen Codes. No, I will not use the new name. It'll be Twitter forever. <laughs> uh, I work at Shopify as a senior staff uh, software engineer, which is a mouthful of a title. Um, I'm on the Ruby and Rails infrastructure team. For years, Shopify has been investing in Ruby and Rails, and I'm proud to work somewhere that deeply cares about this community. I spend most of my time working on ensuring Rails uh, can scale for Shopify. While all of this work benefits us directly, uh, the work we do aims to improve Rails and Ruby for everyone in the community. I've been contributing to Rails since 2014, and I've been a member of the Rails core team since 2017. The core team is responsible for the future of the Rails framework, and we work together to plan new features and releases. If you want to know more about how we work together and what the Rails core team does, uh, we're going to be doing a panel tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m., 9.45, I'm not sure. 9.45, 9.45 uh, <laughs> in this room. So when you've been working on Rails for as long as I have, you start to take for granted the way the framework is designed and built. From the outside, Rails seems like a big black box full of secrets only a few know. It's difficult to find your way around the code base through the maze of gems. It often feels like you're lost without a map. While Rails might look like a mess from the outside, it's actually a deliberate, complex, and beautiful framework. It's not designed to be perfect or solved for every use case. Of course, it has flaws like any other framework. The premise of Rails is to provide a more complete experience compared to other ecosystems. Rails was built to empower developers and unlock our productivity. Today, we're going to explore the magic of Rails. We'll look at the philosophy behind the framework, as well as the overall structure of the components. We'll explore some of the common patterns that Rails uses to build agnostic interfaces and techniques it implements to hide complexity so you can stay focused on building your application. By the end of this talk, you'll feel more confident navigating the Rails code base and better understand the patterns it uses to create the framework we all know and love. But Rails is also so much more than its design and architecture. We'll dive into my motivations for working on the framework and why the community is so important to the long-term success of Rails. So what is Ruby on Rails? When I ask this question, I don't want to know what the technical definition of Rails is as an MVC framework, but rather what makes Rails seem like magic? What are the driving principles behind its design? Uh, what sets Rails apart from other frameworks? Rails is modular but not fractured. While the framework is a set of components, we should be careful not to confuse modularity with lacking cohesion. In the early days, Rails was tightly coupled, and it was pretty much impossible to use one component without the rest of the framework. When MERB and Rails merged in 2008, it changed the architecture of the Rails framework, and from that day forward, we had built-in modularity and clear lines between gems. Today, we maintain strict rules for uh, each gem and what components they're allowed to depend on. For example, active model only depends on active support, and we won't accept changes that break that contract. We want, more, we want developers to be able to choose between using all of Rails or just what they need. This empowers Sinatra users to use active support if they desire, while ensuring the framework is bundled as a cohesive code base by default. Rails is designed to have agnostic interfaces. While the framework provides a set of defaults for applications, we don't require to use the tools that we've built in support for, we accomplish this by building interfaces that any tool that wants to work out of the box with Rails can. If you don't like Minitest, you can use RSpec without much effort. 
if your application requires SQL Server instead of one of the default supported databases, you still only just need to add a gem and update your database configuration. For the most part, Active Record will just do the rest. We've implemented similar inter interfaces for file upload services and active storage and job queues and active job. These agnostic interfaces require that external gems work with our provided APIs, but the upside is it empowers you to make whatever decisions you'd like about your application. And the best part is you can change your mind mid-development without rewriting all of your existing code. The Rails framework is unique in that a lot of its functionality has been directly extracted from existing production applications. The very first iteration of the framework came from Basecamp Classic. Since then, we've upstreamed multiple database behavior from GitHub, the sharding functionality was influenced by Shopify's monolith, and many other features have been upstreamed from our applications over the years. Because we build and design Rails based on the real needs of production applications, we can ensure that features in the framework are stable, resilient, and performant. We test out APIs to see how they look and feel before they become a permanent part of the framework. This is especially important because once a feature is released, we can't remove or change it without deprecation. We want to uh, avoid unnecessary churn or an API that doesn't feel like it belongs there. Extracting functionality that we've proven out in our applications is a great way to build sol solid and reliable APIs. There's one thing that's hard to deny, and it's that Rails has aesthetic taste. You might not love the aesthetic, but it's easy to see that Rails aims to create beautiful, simple, and self-documenting APIs. The core team spends a lot of time debating interfaces that applications will consume. We will endlessly discuss the right words and how to use them, not because we love bike shedding, but because we want new features to feel like they've always belonged in Rails. The framework's interfaces are not accidental. They are deliberate and focused on look and feel above all else. You might be wondering, though, if Rails cares so much about aesthetics, then why is the code base so difficult to navigate? Why is it easy to get lost in framework internals if Rails cares so much about your experience? Well, this is because Rails um, cares more about your application than it does its own internals. The framework will gladly take on complexity so that you don't have to. To build your application, you don't need to know how to parse the database YAML, how to connect to those databases, how to talk to WebSockets, how to implement a test harness, or how to build an image uploader. Why should you need to write the same boilerplate functionality for every application you build? Why should you even need to think about what the MySQL command for creating a database is when all, all you really want to, or ta database table is, when all you really want to do is get up and running for your future customers? Rails will handle all of this and more for you so that you can focus on building your application. The way Rails hides complexity is a feature, not a bug. Rails is, of course, not simply defined by these five tenants, but they represent the motivations and goals of the core team and how we think about the framework. The architecture of Rails didn't happen by accident. The way it's built is a deliberate choice to abandon certain ways of doing things in order to optimize for the human experience of building web applications. Because of everything Rails tries to do for you, the code base can be incredibly difficult to navigate. There is no one person on the core team who understands how every part of Rails works, but because we all understand the patterns that govern development, we can usually figure out how any part of the framework is implemented. Once you understand how it's designed and architected, finding your way around becomes a lot easier. Rails is made up of 12 components seen here. The first version had just four gems, Active Record, Action Mailer, Action Pack, and Rail Ties. Out of the 12 current components, four are original, three are extracted from those, and five are additions. The decision to add new components doesn't happen often. We want to be mindful about what does and does not end up in the framework, because anything that we do add needs to be maintained by the core team. There's only 12 of us, and while that sounds like we have one person per component, it doesn't work out that way. Each one of us on the core team has an area of expertise, but none of us are the owner of any particular component. One of the things that comes up often when talking about how Rails is designed is what is the significance of the naming convention? Why are some gems prefixed with active and others prefixed with action? And you might be wondering, why does Rails ties not follow the same convention? Well, the libraries that are prefixed with active are generally ones that support backend behavior. These include active record, active support, active model, active job, and active storage. They are all responsible for doing things behind the scenes. The naming convention was originally influenced by the active record pattern, which active record is, of course, named after. 
So it made sense to use the same prefix for other backend-like components. DHH wanted all of the gems to follow a similar naming convention, so action followed active to indicate the parts of the framework that are more user-facing. These are action mailer, action pack, action view, action cable, action text, and action mailbox. The rule for how to name a framework is sometimes a little bit blurry. You could argue that action cable isn't nearly as user-facing as this diagram implies, but hardly anything is perfect. <laughs> Lastly, the piece that ties all the frameworks together is rail ties, hence its name. A railroad tie is the cross brace that supports uh, metal rail on a railroad track, so it makes sense that rail ties would not follow the action and active naming convention since it is the part that ties everything together. Rail ties defines the Rails constant and is our entry point into an application. One important thing to know is that while Rail ties is the core of the framework, none of the gems in Rails depend on it. This is what allows you to use parts of Rails without committing to using the entire framework. The modularity of Rails is a conscious choice to give you the freedom to use only what you need. Rails implements a bunch of common patterns and techniques to build the interfaces and APIs that applications consume. Ruby on Rails makes heavy use of factory patterns, inheritance, metaprogramming, and uses a series of hooks and callbacks to control the load order um, of components and their configuration. Navigating Rails code can be incredibly difficult, but because it's taking on so much complexity uh, in order to provide a consistent interface and simple APIs. However, the techniques that Rails uses enables the framework to provide an application development experience unmatched by any other framework. Let's first look at how the components uh, interact with rail ties to get a better sense of the role it plays in the initialization process and how it ties the framework's components together. The entry point uh, from an application to a component is rail ties. Any gem that needs to hook into the initialization process will contain a file called railtie.rb. This is where we define the load hooks for the framework, which uh, will apply configuration and settings to the application. In addition, the config environments and config initializers are how your, your application hooks into rail ties and the components. So not every component in the Rails framework implements a rail tie. It depends on whether the gem needs to extend or modify the initialization process. External gems that need to interact with initialization and configuration also need to provide a rail tie. Think of it as an API for hooking into Rails while your application is booting. The rail tie functionality in a component can only be used in a Rails application. If you're using Active Record with Sinatra, for example, you're going to need to apply the configuration yourself. Some of the things that just work out of the box with Rails will need to be manually implemented when using components outside of the framework. So let's look at a quick diagram of how Rail Ties works. When you boot your Rails application, Rail Ties will register the load hooks for each component from the defined initializers. Then it waits until each component is loaded. And then once they are done loading, those hooks that were registered before the application was booted will then be run. In general, rail ties are, initializers are run in the order that they are defined. Uh, therefore, anything in your application will run after Rails initializers. This functionality also enables lazy loading Rails components, which makes boot time faster. Let's take a look at some code to see how this works in practice. If you look at the railtie.rb file in any of the components, you'll see they define a bunch of initializer blocks that look something like this. If we take a look at the definition in Rails, we can see the initializer takes two arguments, a name and an options hash. The name is simply used as an identifier, and the only options that are accepted are before and after, which uh, can be used to control the load order, um, the order that initializers are run in. In most cases, we don't set any options because we want the initializers to run as they are defined. However, before and after options are useful if we want one component's initializer to run after an another component's initializer. And we'll take a look at an example later on. Initializers take a block which returns the application that we're working on. This can be used to interact with the methods defined on the application object or access the config object as seen here. Within these initializer blocks, you'll often see on an onload hook that tells Rails to register an action but wait until a specific component is loaded to call the code inside the initializer. Onload hooks enable the ability to apply configuration lazily by registering a hook that will be called when the library is loaded. The Rails initializers are often used to set up required functionality as an application boots. For example, if you've ever used Active Record outside of Rails, you'll probably notice that you had to call establish connection in order to run queries. However, in a Rails application, if you look at it, you, unless you're using multiple databases, you never called establish connection. 
So where does that initial connection come from? An initializer, of course. If we look at the RELTI.RB in, in the active record component, we can find the initializer that is responsible for establishing connections to the active record base uh, class when we boot our Rails application. The name of the initializer is active record initialized database. Uh, because we have an onload hook, this initializer will not load uh, or not run until the active record component has fully loaded. When this code is run, we, it will first find the database YAML from the application's path and parse the ERB. It will then pass the result to uh, the active record base configuration setter. This turns the YAML into database configuration objects. Once the database configurations are set, uh, established connection is called, and it will use the, uh, whatever the current environment is. And that's it. That's how Rails sets configurations and sets up the initial connection. Establishing this initial connection for you is one of the many things that Rails does when you boot your Rails application. Initializers also let us avoid calling components if they aren't included in a Rails application. In this, in this initializer uh, called Active Record Log Runtime, we can see that Active Record will include the controller runtime module um, only if action controller is loaded. And it will include the job runtime module only if active job is loaded. If an application doesn't include action controller or active job, these modules will never be included in your application. This avoids uh, coupling active record to active job or action control or action pack, um, and requiring us that we that requiring that we depend on any of these components if we don't want to. An initializer is also where the component deprecators are defined. Here we can even see this initializer is using the before option, indicating that it should run before the load environment config initializer. The argument passed must, must match the identifier as it was defined. In this case, uh, load environment config is defined in rel ties as a symbol. Uh, you'll notice in most cases it will be a string. It just depends on how and where the initializer was defined and what we set it as. It's just an identifier. It's not um, that complex. <laughs> uh, while these are all really simple examples that fit on my slides, there are plenty of more complex initializers in Rails. Uh, the next time you're curious what Rails is doing on boot, pop open one of the RailsHi.RB files in a component to find out. The important thing to take away from this is that RailsHi's is the core of the framework, and it is what ties our applications to each component. Most of the major components in Rails will implement a RailsHi to apply configuration and set up the application during the initialization process. Without the RailsHi initializers, we would have to establish database connections in our app, set up our own deprecators, load the schema cache ourselves, and a lot more. The role of rail ties is to handle configuration and initialization for you, so you don't have to think about all of these moving parts. Rails uses the initializers with onload hooks to control the load order and ensure that hooks are run at the right time. It prevents a component from being loaded too early and is also one of the ways that we ensure Rails uh, configuration doesn't override application configuration. Lastly, rel ties enables components to interact with other components without making them dependencies. Because the rel tie waits until a component is loaded to call its code, we can define behavior for when a particular gem is available in an application. For example, active record will not include the job runtime module if active job is not loaded, if it's, um, only if it is loaded. If it's never loaded, we just don't create an unnecessary dependency between active record and active job or in your application. While we only looked at a couple small examples, this just barely scratches the surface of the power of load hooks. The next time you're wondering where configuration is coming from, look in the components rel ties for the answer. So earlier we talked about how Rails provides agnostic interfaces, which enables you to swap out default functionality as long as external tools implement the interfaces that Rails provides. An example of this is how the active record database adapters are implemented. By default, Rails provides support for four database adapters, SQLite, Postgres, MySQL 2, and Trilogy. Trilogy is a new adapter for MySQL that was built at GitHub. It will be available in the 7.1 release. If you look at Active Record's code base, you'll notice that we never call isa on the database uh, connections adapter. This is because the adapters are implemented in such a way that their interface is agnostic to the database client that we're using in our application. We achieve this by building an abstract adapter that implements the API. Then all concrete adapters inherit from that abstract adapter. The way this works is the abstract ad adapter defines the default interface. Um, you should never interact with the abstract adapter directly in your application because all the adapters answer to the same methods. That's why we built them this way. 
So you should only ever interact with a concrete adapter directly. Each concrete adapter then inherits from the abstract adapter and therefore defines the same interface through inheritance. The default behavior for each method is stored on the abstract class since that is where we define that interface. Concrete adapters, including the ones external to Rails, are required to inherit from the abstract adapter to get this shared interface and implement the same public APIs. The pattern that we use to create agnostic interfaces in Rails means that we can call a method like supports foreign keys and we don't need to do an is a check, all the adapters answer to that same method. If a concrete adapter wants to have different behavior from the default, it can re-implement the method to change behavior. As an example, here we have the definition for supports foreign keys on the abstract adapter. We can see that by default it's set to false. If we look at the Postgres adapter, we'll see this method is re-implemented and it's setting support foreign keys to true. The MySQL 2, Trilogy, and SQLite 3 adapters all do the same thing. The abstract adapter sets, us, sets this to false rather than true because we don't know if external adapters that we don't control will be able to support foreign keys. This creates an interface where foreign keys are opt-in for any database adapter in Rails. Another example of a place where we use a similar pattern to create agnostic interfaces is active storage. Active storage implements this interface slightly differently from active record. Here we have a class called service, which is equivalent to our abstract adapter. Uh, it's our abstract class that defines the interface. But instead of defining default behavior in the abstract service, we raise a not implemented error. This signals to external gems implementing an active storage interface that they must implement this method for their service to work with Rails. We don't raise a not implemented error for active record on most methods because the default behavior is less complex to implement. It's also a much older component with different patterns that we've changed how we want to do them over the years. There are a lot of other methods in here, but I've pasted just the delete method as an example. If we open up Google Cloud Storage, uh, we can see the implementation for the delete functionality. Every available service for active storage will implement this method in the concrete service where the abstract service raises a not implemented error. This agnostic interface allows Rails to call the delete method on the service object without having to check what service we're using. Whatever service we have in our configuration, Rails will call these methods on and our service will answer. Using this pattern reduces code complexity and makes it super clear what the interface is. We can guarantee that Rails will just work as long as the concrete service classes inherit from the abstract service and implements the new behavior for each method. To recap, Rails uses abstract classes and inheritance in order to implement agnostic interface and agnostic and consistent interfaces for the services that we support. It also provides an easy way for library authors to build their own service or adapter. Rails implements an abstract class, which all those concrete classes will inherit from. The abstract class is responsible for defining the interface and the concrete classes are responsible for changing behavior by redefining those methods. You will see this pattern anywhere in the Rails code base that we need to implement a single interface that responds to the same methods. One of the benefits of this pattern is it simplifies the Rails code base by avoiding calling isa everywhere. We can assume that any call on any adapter or service will implement the uh, interface that is defined. Anytime we call a method, Rails already knows how to respond. This also avoids undefined method errors for any external adapter or service. They can fall back to the default defined behavior or get a not implemented error to indicate that they have to define that method. In addition to simplifying the Rails code, the patterns uh, we use to create agnostic interfaces make it easy for applications to swap out adapters and classes. If, you're, um, if, you're, if you start your application with Postgres, you can easily switch to MySQL 2 by updating the gem file and database configuration. This applies to active storage services as well. Don't like Google Cloud? That's fine. You can switch to Azure by adding a gem and updating the storage config. Everything just works unless you're doing something custom. These interfaces also allow us to provide a set of defaults without forcing you to be locked into what we provide if you want to use something else. Lastly, implementing a default set of interfaces that any external provider can hook into lowers the maintenance burden for the core team. We don't need to know how every available service that exists on the planet works. We, instead, we provide the ones that we're comfortable maintaining. Rails is a big framework with a small maintainer team, so we need to ensure that we're not taking on more of a maintenance burden than we're able to support. Agnostic interfaces that implement a stable API for external gems allows us to avoid taking on support for an infinite number of providers while not locking you into the options that we've provided. In addition to the patterns that we looked at, Rails makes heavy use of metaprogramming 
to build simple and beautiful APIs. Because of this, it can be difficult to find where behavior is defined. A lot of what you think of as Rails magic is powered by metaprogramming. While it can be difficult to trace the code that uses this technique, it's essential to building APIs that are beautiful and hide complexity. There are a lot of examples of metaprogramming in Rails, but today we're only going to look at one small one where, of how we use class eval to build the association's getter and setter APIs. Let's say we have two models, post and comment. Post has many comments, and comment belongs to a post. Pretty easy. Have you, have you ever wondered how we're able to call post.comments without defining this method in our model? How does post even know about the comments method at all? Active Record has no idea that we're going to add this to your that you're going to add this to your model, so there's no way that we have a hard-coded comments definition in Rails. Figuring out where this is defined can be a little difficult. When I don't know where something is defined in Rails, I use Ruby's source location method, which will give us the file name and line number of where any method is defined. We can find the definition of components by calling method uh, on post and passing comments as a symbol. This will work for anything that's defined on post. Then we can call source location, which will output the information that we need. If source location returns nil, it means that either the method is defined in a C extension or C Ruby itself. This tells us that the comments method is defined in association.rb on line 103. And if we open that file, we can see that it points to a method in Active Records Association class named define readers. This method takes a mixin and a name. Using the mixin passed in, Rails will call class eval on it. Now, if we don't know how this metaprogramming works, we might assume that the mixin here is the post model class. However, it's actually a dynamic module called post generated association methods. This is dynamically created when the post model is loaded. This module is where we will store all the meth instance methods that we need to define on post to access our associations. I'm pointing this out because in a lot of cases, the magic behind associations and active record comes from methods, classes, or modules that are dynamically generated when you boot your Rails application and your models are then loaded. It's not obvious this is how uh, associations work if you haven't spent time in the code. Okay, back to define readers. So inside the class eval block, block, a method is defined using the name that we called. In this case, it would become def comments. Uh, Active Record looks up the association from the association cache and then calls reader on it. Using metaprogramming here lets us provide the API to access comments on post rather than forcing you to implement your own comments method or calling this line manually. The writer method has a similar looking definition except for that it calls writer and passes value. You can see that these definitions are almost the same, but each, uh, each are implementing a different instance method. You'll also notice that class eval, in class eval, we can see file and line plus one. Without this, we wouldn't be able to find the source location of the comments method. This is a feature of Ruby that lets us define the file and line number of a metaprogrammed API to make debugging easier. There are a lot more methods that are dynamically generated when, uh, when working with associations in Rails, but we can't cover more of that today. My hope is that by showing you how we use metaprogramming to build one of the beautiful and simple APIs in Rails, that the next time this will feel less magical when you're working with an association. Association accesses are just one example of how we use metaprogramming in Rails to provide your application with beautiful, simple, and clean APIs. Without utilizing this functionality, we would not have methods like post.comments and active record. Metaprogramming makes Rails a lot more complex internally, but the trade-off is it enables us to hide complexity from your application. The alternative would be running your own queries and defining your own comments getter and setter. That doesn't sound very fun, does it? Rails doesn't want you to have to do that yourself. We want to provide you with sensible, self-documenting, simple APIs that just work. It's the beauty of Rails, and it's where a lot of the um, okay, so-called magic comes from. This thing is a little delayed. <laughs> Uh, we use metaprogramming techniques throughout the framework, like method missing, class eval, instance eval, define method, generated modules, and much more. Metaprogramming enables us to build interfaces for migrations, generators. Many of the features in Rails that you use every day are built using some metaprogramming. While super powerful, this does make Rails internals more difficult to navigate. The trade-off is you get to focus on your application. You don't have to think about how these methods are generated. Rails just handles it for you. So when I first started working, uh, first started building Rails applications, I didn't know how Rails internals worked at all. I had no idea how Rails was architected, 
the role that rel ties plays, how we use metaprogramming, or how Rails uses common patterns to create agnostic interfaces. I had no appreciation for how Rails is designed and built. In my early days working on the framework, I frankly had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I got stuck often, I made mistakes, I got frustrated, but I still found contributing to the framework exhilarating. For me, Rails is so much more than just a framework because it's played a huge role in my life and career. I've met some of my closest friends through the Rails community. This framework challenges me, it motivates me, it's a part of me. I was first introduced to Ruby on Rails around 2010 when I was working at a web development agency building Flash ads and WordPress sites for various clients. We started getting requests for sites that needed more than WordPress could provide, so we began building some applications with Ruby on Rails. As soon as I started working on Rails applications, I felt something shift. Everything seemed so much simpler to me than other languages and frameworks. Something about it just made sense. It was like finding home. But because I had no formal computer science training and I was entirely self-taught programming, learning Rails um, was going at a slower pace than I wanted. Uh, I knew that if I took a class, it would jumpstart my understanding of how to build more advanced Rails applications. So in 2011, I attended a week-long intensive uh, workshop at Big Nerd Ranch for Ruby on Rails. After that class, I was absolutely enamored with the framework. For me, writing Rails was so different from writing PHP, it felt like it was designed for how my brain works. I loved how Rails let me be more expressive and productive. After learning Rails at Big Nerd Ranch, I changed jobs because I only wanted to build Rails applications going forward. I continued to fall in love with the framework and eventually started thinking about how I could be more involved in the community. I genuinely wanted to contribute to the framework to fix bugs and improve it, but I didn't think I was good enough to do that. Everyone on the core team is so smart and talented, I, I had a, I, and I had just learned Rails a couple of years ago. I didn't know the first thing about how internals worked. I had a goal to contribute, but I didn't know how to get there. In 2014, I spoke at my first Ruby conference in Salt Lake City. I gave a talk on how Active Record isn't magic. Uh, it can't always build performant queries for you, so it's important to pay attention to what SQL is being generated. I was so nervous giving that talk because Aaron Patterson was in the audience, and he's an Active Record expert. I remember thinking, what if I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm entirely wrong about how this works? Well, it turned out I wasn't wrong, and I had found a bug in Delete All and Aaron offered to help me fix it. Shortly after that conference, I made my first contribution to Rails. It was exhilarating to be giving back to the framework that changed my career trajectory. In 2015, I gave a workshop on how to contribute to Rails at my first Rails conf because I wanted to make it easier for newcomers to contribute like I was. I remember walking into the conference being absolutely intimidated by the sea of unknown attendees. I ended up meeting a lot of great people that year, many of whom I now call good friends. While it was early in my Rails career, that conference highlighted for me what the community meant. Everyone was so welcoming, welcoming and friendly. One of the sessions that year was a panel with the Rails core team. Since I wasn't on the team I wa yet, I watched envious of everyone on stage because I wanted to be a part of that. I didn't want to be on the core team for fame or power. Uh, instead, I wanted to influence the framework's direction. I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to push the boundaries of what everyone thought Rails could do. I wanted to give back to the community, community that gave me so much more than just a job. In 2017, I was invo invited to join the core team. I've been working on Rails for three years and focused most of my work up to that point on improving performance in Active Record and the test frameworks. I had also built the system testing functionality for Rails 5.1, which provides a wrapper around Capybara so that applications um, were required to implement less setup for browser testing. When, as a, when I was invited to join the core team, I was working at GitHub uh, and started implementing multiple database behavior into Rails. I saw it as something that Rails needed to, con to, uh, needed to have to continue to be a choice for developers, and so I pursued that work. Since then, I've dedicated my time to improving Active Records database support to handle more advanced needs like sharding, automatic database switching, and more. It's absolutely wild to me that I'm I've been working on Rails for 10 years, and now that I've been on the core team for six years, Rails is now 20 years old, which means that I've been working on this framework for half its existence. I've dedicated most of my career as a software engineer to working on the Rails framework. 
Today, I remain on the core team and choose to spend most of my time working on the framework for a lot of reasons. I work on Rails to advance the framework. Frameworks need to evolve with the needs of applications and developers. Without advancement, the framework would stagnate and there would be a smaller community of users and contributors. A stale framework is an abandoned framework. Rails must keep up with technology as it evolves. I'm on the Rails core team because I want to see Rails grow far beyond what it is capable of today. Multiple databases and sharding are only a feature in Rails because I saw a need for it and I built that. Applications had problems scaling their databases and it made sense for Rails to provide this feature out of the box. Pushing the boundaries of what the framework can do is paramount to its continued success as a choice for developers. The premise of Rails is to provide a more complete experience than any other framework. But that experience needs to account for, uh, for not just for new applications, but applications as they mature and grow. I work on Rails to ensure that applications that start on Rails can stay on Rails. Sometimes that means advancing the framework, but other times that means refactoring existing functionality instead of building new features. What made sense in 2003 that no longer makes sense to be included today? What functionality hasn't been able to keep up, the, keep up with the changing industry? Is there something that we can change, remove, or improve in the framework so that applications can keep using Rails? Rails needs to have people on the core team who are looking at the current state of Rails applications and considering what they need to uh, not just use Rails today, but to keep using Rails for years to come. I work on Rails to build a stronger community of users and contributors. As more and more users find Rails, I want them to feel the same joy I felt when I first ran Rails new. But new users aren't enough to keep a community thriving. We also need new contributors so that we have fresh ideas and understand the novel problems that we haven't seen before. Everyone working on Rails has different motivations and priorities, so we need contributors who are interested in areas we don't have covered. I work on Rails and I'm on the core team so that I can take an active role in shepherding new contributors. I want to be there to nurture them, um, them and especially if they're willing to keep coming back. I work on Rails because it's where I can have the biggest possible impact on the future of, the Rails, of, future of Rails and the community. I want to see the Rails framework continue to grow and support applications of all sizes and maturities. I want to see the Rails community thrive. While I work for Shopify and part of my job is to ensure that Rails supports our applications, my allegiance is to the framework. I'm not on core for the other people on core or because it makes me feel important or because Shopify pays me to work on Rails. I'm on the Rails core team because I want to make this the best damn framework possible. I know that if I wasn't working on Rails, I would have less of an impact on the framework and community. Working on Rails gives me purpose, and that's because Rails is so much more than just a framework. Rails isn't just code or just Ruby, Ruby, more Ruby code or just a framework that empowers developers. Rails is something greater than the sum of its parts. Rails is inspiring. It brought us convention over configuration to help us eliminate boilerplate code. Rails, along with Django, popularized the MVC pattern Rails inspired Elixir's Phoenix framework and PHP's Laravel framework. Even if you don't love Rails and think we make weird choices, you can't deny that it didn't influence so much of what we know as modern web development today. Rails is not just inspiring, it's empowering. Rails wants you to be productive, so we swept away all the tedious problems like scaffolding and migrations and database connections so that nothing is in your way. Rails builds agnostic interfaces so we can provide sensible defaults without locking you into whatever we think is best. We ensure that Rails is modular so that if you don't want to use the whole thing, you're fine to just use the parts you like. Do you prefer Sinatra but you really want active record? You're able to do that. You want to write a simple script but really would love some daytime helpers from active support? You're able to do that. But there's also a reason that we have a video of how to build a blog in 15 minutes. It's because Rails does everything in its power to empower you to build quickly and efficiently while keeping complexity out of your way. Rails is also imperfect. I spent a lot of this talk telling you how great I think Rails is and all the things it does for you, but I can't say it's without flaws. Rails aims to be a framework that meets most of users' needs. Rails doesn't try to do everything under the sun. Instead, it wants to make you productive by giving you most of what you need. Rails is also imperfect because it's, almost, because it's 20 years old. It's no longer an unruly teenager. It's a mature and stable framework. But sometimes maturity means imperfection because we can't just change functionality if applications depend on how it works today. 
Rails is imperfect because the people working on it are imperfect. We make mistakes, we add features we thought were a good idea at the time, we've broken builds, we've broken apps, we created security vulnerabilities, but imperfection is a part of being human. Rails is also the applications we build with it. From small businesses to large enterprises, Rails powers so much of the applications we interact with daily. There are thousands and thousands of applications in the world using this framework. They are just one piece of what makes up Rails. Rails is the team behind it. As a maintainer of Rails, uh, my goal is to see the framework evolve and ensure that the community of contributors continues to grow. The maintainers are the ones making sure that releases happen on a regular cadence, that features get merged, we help new contributors, we answer bug reports, we hang out in Discord. Without the 12 core team members and the 27 uh, other maintainers, we wouldn't have Rails as, as it is today. In the years since Rails has been open source, 6,512 individuals have contributed. Every single person who has made a change to the framework is a part of Rails. And of course, Rails is the community. The community is not just the core team or just the framework. It's all of us. We make the community what it is. Without a community of users and contributors, Rails is just thousands of lines of Ruby code. But we all know that Rails is so much more than that. It's human-centered design, agnostic interfaces, and beautiful APIs that are extracted from applications. It inspires and empowers developers. It's imperfect and flawed. It's the applications we build, it's the team behind it, and it's the community. And maybe it's a little sentimental to say, but I actually do think Rails is magic. The role each of us play in Rails development, community, and future are what makes it magic. It's up to all of us to continue building this framework and community so that new people come join us and those who are here stay. At Rails World today, I want you to introduce yourself to someone that you don't know. Go out of your way to connect with each other. It's really easy to subtweet or complain on social media. It's a lot harder to form real connections with real people. We've lost a lot of that in the past few years and we need to work hard to get it back. Connecting with people is the reason that we're all here. It's what makes this all worth it. We might have different goals, but we all care about the same thing, the Ruby on Rails framework. I hope you'll join me in being a present and active part of Rails' future. Let's work together to ensure this framework and this community are something that we want to keep coming back to. Thank you.